We all have about 600 acres of irrigated cropland, 7,000 acres of, um, of, of rangeland, and then a, this small vineyard that we're working on, this regenerative uh, vineyard project that we're working on. Um, and um, the, uh, we're, again, we're located on the central coast of California. So that puts us about two hours south of San Francisco. Um, and this is a visual representation of a simple, and you guys will get a, a lot of this really fantastic artwork. So brace yourself. <laughs> um, this is a simple representation of what we're trying to move from and what we're trying to move towards. Um, the, uh, on your left there, is kind of more of the conventional approach that viticulture has taken in a lot of the, the big viticulture growing regions like California, uh, like places like Australia, where um, wine growing has gotten pretty conventional and that is based on, on fossil fuel, um, heavy machinery, a lot of outside inputs, fertilizers, chemicals, and it's basically farmed as a monoculture. Um, what we're trying to do is get away from that base completely really and base all of our wine growing, all of our farming practices on solar energy, on crop diversity, on uh, the um, taking advantage of the photosynthetic capacity of plants and the advantage of having the diversity of plants, utilizing livestock as one of the ways that we mimic nature and using um, technology that is less um, industrial, and that would be like in the form of a grazing plan. Um, as I go through this presentation, I'm gonna be showing two examples of how we're doing this. Uh, one of the big things I'm gonna be focusing on is how we integrate animals into our, our, our cropping practices. And the first way that I developed a number of years ago was just by simply having an electrified wire that keeps the, the sheep from grazing the vines. Um, the second approach that we are now using at Picinus Ranch is actually a trellis system that is elevated out of reach of the, of the, uh, of the sheep so that we're not, we don't have to do the electrified system. So what, we, what, we've, what we're trying to do is design for all of these principles that we, that we believe in and want to practice rather than trying to modify something that was not designed for this to start with. So as I go through this, you're gonna see a lot of examples and the big indicator is going to be basically how high the vines are trained. Um, some, of this, some of this basic principles we work with, we actually have a couple pages of, of principles that we're working from and that tends to change and get modified pretty regularly. But these are some of the basic ones we're, we're using, which is to keep the soil covered throughout the year, either with living ve vegetation or residue to minimize soil disturbance, which is primarily in the form of tillage, especially deep tillage and frequent tillage, to encourage all kinds of diversity in all kinds of species, um, plants, insects, uh, microbial communities, and have plant roots, living plant roots growing through as much of the year as possible. You have a little bit of an unfair advantage in a Mediterranean climate like we are in because we can grow things throughout the year and integrate well-managed livestock. Uh, the last one is working with people that are passionate and understanding of the principles that we're using. If somebody doesn't believe in this process, if, if they are, are more a follower of conventional agriculture, um, then um, it's, it's, it's probably not going to work for them or us. So I'm gonna go through a lot of these principles and what you're going to see pretty quickly is that our practices fall under a lot of these headings. And so sometimes when I'm talking about one thing um, or, or I'll combine several things and you'll see examples of that in our practices. So I'm gonna take on a couple of these now, the, the um, encouraging diversity and having living roots in the soil. Um, so this is, uh, I believe this is from this summer, earlier this summer. Um, we have a, a number of both native and non-native plants that are growing in the vineyard um, for various purposes. Um, 
these are mainly for pollinators to encourage pollinator species and provide habitat and food for those. Um, this is an example of a spider web growing in our soil, in our, um, in our vineyard floor, which as you can see is covered with residue. Uh, this is a native plant. This is a, a, a milkweed. And this plant is a great pollinator plant and nectar source for a lot of our native insects. And these are showing up in our vineyard just um, on their own. Um, this is a gopher snake. We do have a lot of species of snakes here and we have a lot of rodents. And therefore we like to encourage our snakes. Um, and that's it. that dog is a full grown golden retriever. So you can just imagine how big that snake is. Um, keeping the soil covered throughout the year again. Uh, this is a shot during the winter, what the vineyard looks like. Um, this was uh, shortly after planting. We probably had a couple hundred sheep in here. This section is 12 and a half acres. Um, and we plant a cover crop in here every year and we graze that through the non-growing season non-growing season of the vines. To show you an example of what's happening, uh, for those of you, especially who aren't in the world of wine growing, this is just over the hill from us, those mountains you see in the background, we are on the other side of those mountains. And there is thousands upon thousands of acres of vineyards managed like this. Um, the ground is left bare or mostly bare through most of the year. And if there is a cover crop, it's usually just one species like this. Um, for some reason, they like to do the every other row. Um, and the row that isn't planted to vines is, is they use tillage in that to keep all the weeds and other things, uh, all the other plants away. Um, this is a shot during the summer on a foggy morning. And you can see a couple things. I'm looking not down the rows, but across the rows. And one of the things that those of you in, involved in grape growing will notice a is that the, the vines are to higher and that there is access both directions in the vineyard. So sheep, people, um, if, you have, if you have a small piece of equipment like a, a quad, you can go any direction in the vineyard because the trellis is trained high. Our, our drip line is also trained high. You can see that is, um, is, uh, is just below the canopy of the vines there. And that uh, in spite of the fact that we are in the middle of, of summer, we have the ground covered, well covered by vegetation, uh, primarily dead vegetation. A couple of things occur with that. We, having the soil covered throughout the year increases the, the livability of the soil for, for microbiology. So when that soil is covered during the that this fog will, will burn off when the sun comes out and the, we can get pretty hot. We can get temperatures well over hundred degrees sometimes in the summer. And that, the, the effect of that on the soil is to, is to actually magnify that if the soil is bare. And you can have temperatures that are up to 50 degrees hotter than the ambient, the air temperature on the soil surface if the surface is bare. Whereas keeping the soil covered allows a, uh, a much more hospitable climate for those microbes and, and things like earthworms and other living organisms in the soil. So it's a way of keeping the soil protected throughout the year. Um, the, the, the more common practice in this area then is to keep the soil bare and to use tillage. So that's, that's going against a couple of the principles that we like to promote. And one of the problems with tillage, just from a, again, a kind of an ecological perspective, especially a soil ecology perspective, is that this, this vineyard here probably had a really nice cover crop in it. And once you till that in, um, you are adding nutrients to the soil, but the majority of the carbon that is added to that will blow off as CO2 probably within eight, to 14 days. So although that carbon is going in, you're losing most of it because you're, you're, you're basically aerating that soil so heavily 
that it's that it's oxidizing off. And so you are left with bare ground, which reduces evapotranspiration from the soil, it increases the heat of the vineyard overall, as well as the heat of the soil surface in particular. Um, so I wanted to talk about a trial that I did in which I introduced sheep into a vineyard and some of the benefits that occurred from that. So I primarily, a lot of these benefits were, were accidental in that I did, not in, I did not necessarily go into this intending for these things to happen. But, um, and this is what led to what we're doing now in the, in the realm of designing vineyards to accommodate these and, and, and actually um, further work with ecological principles um, but by introducing sheep into a vineyard throughout the growing season of the vines, um, which you normally cannot do this unless your vines are trained high or you have some way to prevent the sheep from eating them because um, sheep love to eat grape leaves. And it's a, they, I've used sheep in fact to take, to remove vineyards, to take all the vegetation off of them before the, the, the trunks were removed. And so, um, so this was the trial that I did in about, about 10 years ago, looking at how we graze through the growing season of the vines. So we eliminated a lot of the tractor passes, especially those that are involved with tillage and um, mowing and things like that. So we had to do none of that, which eliminated about 10 to 20 tractor passes per row per year. So that in addition to not doing damage to the soil, we weren't releasing the the CO2 or the, the um, carbon into the atmosphere from use of fossil fuels. Um, we eliminated the, the need for hand suckering. All of the hand suckering was done by sheep. Um, we reduced irrigation use 80% over just using sheep during the non-growing season of the vines and 90% reduction in irrigation use compared to the control site that was using conventional management practices. Um, we increased yield by over 1200 pounds an acre over the, the, the normal, um, the average yields. So if you look at those two that I just mentioned, we got a 90% reduction and a 1200 pound increase in yield. So hopefully you're asking yourself how that happened and we will get into that. Uh, we reduced the need to haul in outside sources of fertilizer, compost, et cetera. So we, we actually, during the trial, did none of that. We didn't bring in any outside sources of fertilizer. The only exception to that was that the sheep that were grazing in there were provided with a mineral mix that included some things like zinc and, and copper. Um, all, of, all the vineyard vegetation, what a lot of people would normally call weeds, become a valuable resource. The, what we what, what are referred to weeds are often the first thing that, that the sheep will eat. And we came up with a cost savings of about $450, which was just a little over 11 years ago. So that has probably gone up a fair bit. Um, again, back to the principles, um, minimize soil disturbance tillage um, because we we had sheep in there throughout the, uh, the summertime. We had no need to do any mowing um, or any tillage, any, any means of controlling the vegetation. The sheep grazed all of the, the vegetation under the drip lines that was growing during the summer. So there's no need to do undervine control. And here is an example of, of a vineyard that is using sheep. This is our vineyard this summer. And you can see, and as I mentioned, we have not had rain for nine, well, we've had three quarters of an inch in nine months and we just got that recently. So this, when this picture was taken, there'd probably been so five to six months without any rainfall, but you can see we're still getting some, some vegetation growing up under this nice mulch that we grew in place here. So the soil is, is holding water. Uh, in general, when, um, when you increase your soil holding capacity, your, your carbon capacity in your soil, your organic matter capacity in your soil, when you increase that by 1%, the corresponding increase in water holding capacity is about 18,000 to 22,000 gallons per acre. 
Uh, this is another reason why we don't use tillage is because especially deep tillage and excessive tillage tends to destroy mycorrhizal fungi. And this is a, uh, this is a great root stock that I pulled out um, because it, it, it was being grafted and it didn't take the graft. So I, I pulled out the entire root stock to look at what was going on with the roots and it was covered with mycorrhizal fungi. And this is something that we are actively supporting because of all the benefits of having mycorrhizal fungi in association with any of the plants in the vineyard, but especially the vines, um, which increases the ability of the plant. It increases the range that the plant can access water because of the mycorrhizal filaments, the roots of the mycorrhizal fungi, who are better equipped to access water in, in the micropores of the soil. And um, in exchange, they're getting nutrients from the grapevines. So there's this great um, symbiotic relationship going on between these um, these organisms that we are encouraging by, by respecting the soil, the soil structure and the soil community and not doing practices that damage that. Um, this is a picture of a vineyard that is doing a lot of great stuff. You can see they've got a diversity of plants growing in there. They've got an owl box. Um, but you can also see, and this vineyard is managed biodynamically, that they're doing tillage between the rows. So in spite of all of the good things that are happening, they're negating a lot of those effects by using tillage. And this is one of the keys that allows us to get away from tillage in, in, in grape growing and also in all kinds of, of fruit growing, especially tree crops like um, walnuts and and fruit crops like apples and things like that is we can do the same, we can use these same principles in those situations as well. So one of the first things I want to go through is why, what are the, what are the effects of having animals, grazing animals that are managed properly? And I will re-emphasize that the managed properly thing is really important. And this is why. These are, these are, these are um, photos of a core that was taken from soil. And all these cores were taken from an area about, they were, they were all within 200 feet. It was the same soil, they were, but they were just managed differently. And so this is basically taking a, a tube, a metal tube that is pounded into the ground. And when you pull it out, you get this long uh, tubular shape of soil that you can look at and see what the structure looks like. Um, this was done by uh, the NRCS, which is a government organization that works with farmers and ranchers in this country. And there is a YouTube video on this as well that shows what they did. But there are three different management practices occurring here. And the one on the far right is land that was recently converted from grassland to cropland. And this was managed using no-till practices, but the common no-till practice in this country in the in the Great Plains region is to use herbicides. So the first thing that happened is that it was sprayed with herbicides and then it was planted in probably either corn or soybeans. And you can see that the, that the soil is, that it's lost a lot of its pore space. And it's, the thing that's surprising to me is this is just in one year. And if you go to the next one, they're using continuous season long grazing. So that would mean that they put the, it's probably cattle. This is in either South or North Dakota in the North part of the United States. They probably put cattle in there in maybe May or so. And they graze them probably until uh, this, the fall sometime. You can see that it's got a lot more poor space than the converted cropland. Um, but then when we go to the next side, you can see the well-managed grassland, which is basically, again, back to that idea of mimicking nature. So the cattle in there are mimicking how the bison used to graze in the Great Plains before we eliminated most of them. And the way that they are grazed, that they, that they historically grazed was they were in huge bunches. They moved constantly because they were in huge bunches. So they're constantly dunging and urinating on the ground. And so they needed to move constantly to, to move to fresh feed. And also they were being followed constantly by predators, including humans. And, and that would be in, in Native Americans. But there were um, 
there were, and there were actually numerous species of grazing animals. There were the bison, there was pronghorn, antelope, um, elk, and deer. And the huge were herd, the, the, the herds were huge. Um, but you can see in that one that there's a lot more pore space. The thing that they did after this is they took a water infiltration ring and did a test to see how long it would take one inch of, of water simulating a one inch rainfall uh, period or, or, or event and looking at how long it took that water to go into the soil. So the first slide, the converted cropland took 31 minutes for one inch of rain to infiltrate that soil completely. The continuous season long grazing took about seven minutes to infiltrate. So we've got a big improvement in the infiltration rate. But the well-managed grassland took 11 seconds for one inch of rain to infiltrate. And so the thing that I ask, whether it's farmers or, or, or wine growers or, or any or, or livestock producers, and especially if you're in a dry climate, but also if you're in a wet climate, the, the capacity of the land to absorb water is important. So which one do you want to manage for? And you know, without, without hesitation, everybody wants the, what, what is the well-managed grassland. So to do that, we need to incorporate livestock. Um, I've worked in a couple different climates. One is a Mediterranean climate with, in which rainfall occurs during the winter. And because of that, actually it's, it's usually winter into, into late spring. And this, the top slide is showing that, that the, this brown square is that period when the vines are growing. And then the green hump is showing when the vegetation is growing in the vineyard floor. And the, the blue purple line is showing the gro growing period of the grapevines. But you can see that basically while the grapevines are growing and the, and the floor vegetation is growing, we have to keep the sheep out unless we have a way to keep them in or allow them to be in there. And so that, because of that, we lose a lot of opportunity of cycling all that vegetation through living organisms in the form of, of animals. I've also worked in the Southwestern USA, which has a summer rainy season. And it's basically just pushes that growing season further towards the end of summer. But it's the same, same concept is happening. We leave the animals out. We have to leave the animals out during that time when we really most need them to take advantage of that uh, green vegetation. Um, I found that sheep to be particularly conducive to grazing in vineyards. Um, most species of goats are really heavy browsers and they tend to try and get high up into the, into the vines, our trees, and they will eat bark a lot more than sheep. Um, another great thing about livestock is that they are self-replicating. And um, we don't see that with our, with our things like tractors and stuff because um, they're machinery. <laughs> and so again, it's, again it's, we're mimicking nature. Ma nature doesn't use heavy equipment to manage. It's, it's, um, it's to manage itself. It uses living forms of living organisms. So this is how I developed a way to graze existing vineyards that weren't set up for grazing. It's a very simple concept. It's a electrified wire that goes on either side of the cordon wire. So the, the fruit would be right above the electrified wire here. I, I usually set these up before the sheep, before, before the vines have, um, have leafed out and being curious, the sheep will put their nose up there and get a shock and it creates this zone of fear because electric fence is a psychological barrier, not a physical barrier because it's just a small wire. Um, so the sheep are basically trained to avoid the electric fence and the area around it before there's even any fruit in there. Um, this allows the, the, this solar cycle of sunlight hitting both the vines and the floor crop and for the sheep to graze that, including the suckers that come off of the vine and any of the tendrils that might grow up and over the vine and hang into the row. Um, and this is just going back to that fact that in the current vineyard, we are actually training the vines higher. This is a, this is a, this canopy is divided in both directions. It's divided kind of like a bilateral cordon 
and then it is divided horizontally through the wires. And this is similar to a, 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 um, a table grape or some even raisin uh, trellis systems. One of the good things about this system, especially once it is in full production, is that one third of the vineyard will be in shade, at least one third of the vineyard will be in shade most of the, most of the day. So that will allow for a, a cooling effect on the vineyard, which is particularly important to us and a lot of people in wine growing regions as the temperatures get warmer and warmer, being able to mitigate that change in temperature um, causes a cooling effect. The shade causes a cooling effect, which allows um, uh, a, a cooler growing season. And in addition, this is providing shade for the grazing animals that are in here during the summer and those of us that are working in the vineyard as well. Um, on that last slide, you could also see that there was a, a bluebird box at the end of the row. And that again is one of our ways that we encourage diversity. Bluebirds are great insect predators and, um, and they don't eat fruit. So we don't have an issue with them eating the fruit. Uh, back to the, to the system where we're using an electrified wire, you can see that the sheep are grazing all the suckers and everything below that electric wire and allowing and leaving alone everything above that. So the, the suckering of grapevines is done by the sheep and they, they, they relish that and they don't let those suckers get very big before they chew them off. And one of the things that's interesting is there is a beneficial effect uh, from the saliva of a grazing animal that gets imparted to the plant. So that's another way that we are mimicking nature by allowing that association to occur. Uh, this, is a, this is showing that trial vineyard again. Um, and the side on the right is the trial vineyard. You can tell by the offset, the electrified offset there. And the vineyard on the left is actually just the part of the, is the control site, which was much larger and that was managed conventionally. And you can see that they are doing uh, tillage by the bare ground that is now coming up in weeds. So every time after they till, as long as there's moisture in the soil, the weeds keep coming up. In fact, if you want weeds, tillage is one of the best ways to do that. And on the side that's being grazed, you can see that there is a, there's a, there's a few things growing in there, but we're not getting much competition to the vines from that. And as you learned previously, we got a great reduction in irrigation use, a 90% reduction in irrigation use compared to the, sign, the side that was using tillage. And you are able to see, for those of you who are not familiar with suckers, that's the lower part on the vine that is green and has all the leaves. And that needs to be removed in one way or another because those lower branches, because they're lower on the stalk of the vine, will rob a lot of the nutrients before they get up to your fruit and the upper part of the vine. Um, again, I, I want to emphasize how important it is to manage the livestock correctly in the vineyard. And that means imitating nature by keeping them in a fairly high group, uh, or a fairly tight group, and um, moving them frequently. This is a vineyard that put sheep in there. It was a small amount, but they're in there through most of the winter. And so this area was overgrazed badly. If you go just onto the other side of the fence, where they weren't grazing. Um, the cover crop was about up to above, above waist height. But by having continuous grazing, um, the land is both very compacted and bare. And this is on a slope. It's hard to tell in this photograph, but this is on a slope. And shortly after this picture was taken, there was a large rainfall event. And there's really dramatic erosion that occurred on this site because of poor management of livestock. So one of the ways that we do manage those livestock is by creating a grazing plan. And we do, in addition to grazing the vineyard here, we graze some of the neighboring vineyards. And I've been grazing vineyards for a number of years now. And one of the things that when I'm grazing somebody else's vineyard is that I will sit down with the winemaker and the grape grower and go through and discuss where sheep need to be, where they maybe shouldn't be, and where they need to be as far as management practices. And so it's, it's uh, really important to plan that all out. It may not go according to plan, but at least you have some idea of, of, of what you're, where you want to be and why 
you're going to be there. Um, this is an example. This is imagine this is an overhead uh, view of a vineyard, and the brown spots are sheep grazing. Um, if uh, on the on the left hand side you see that the sheep are bunched tightly up, and we do that with electric fence or some other way of controlling the sheep, and then they are are, are moved according to the plan. So they will stay in that section for a short amount of time. They won't graze it all the way down to the ground. That will allow the, the plants to recover more quickly. <clears throat> and then in this particular uh, slide, they would go up to the top then after this and graze that area that just had a chance to recover. And the other side is the same number of sheep, <clears throat> but they, excuse me, they don't, um, they're not being managed tightly, and so they're overgrazing the entire section. And <clears throat> this is what occurs in a lot of grazing in, in both in and out of vineyards. The first vineyard to adopt this, uh, this electrified deterrent system that I developed on a commercial scale is Ense Vineyard in Victoria, Australia. And they've been using this system now, I believe they're going into their seventh or eighth year and they've been able to eliminate all use of herbicides. And in addition, they have another income stream in the form of, of uh, selling lamb, sheep meat. Again, this is our vineyard in the winter during the, during the non-growing season of the vines. And you can see that the sheep are in a pretty tight bunch and they will be moved frequently. This allows the concentration of dung and urine and which vastly improves the effectiveness of those as, as fertilizers and soil, soil builders. Um, this is just an example of a farmer that was an in, influence, influential on me. And this is a comparison of his practices to his neighbors. So they're all, they all have the same soil and they're all growing similar crops. And this is showing the, the nutrients that are coming up in a soil test. So they did the same soil test on all of these plots. And this is showing the nutrients that are available. And one, the first one is, is, is managed using organic practices. The second one is managed using no-till with low diversity. So that's probably um, corn one year and soybeans another year. And the next one is, is a higher diversity of our, our higher, um, yeah, higher diversity. And, and so it's probably um, corn, soybeans, and wheat. And they use a lot of synthetics in this. And that would include in, in both of the, all of the no-till, no uh, except the last one would include using synthetics, would use, include using herbicides. And then on the final one, which is the, um, the farmer that has been a big influence on us, he is no-till, but he's using livestock. So he's not using any, um, any herbicides. Um, he's got very high diversity because he has a multitude of species in there, including livestock. And the NS is no synthetics. And then he's using um, uh, cover cropping. So you can see these soils all have the same inherent fertility, but he's not adding any any fertilizers, the others are all adding fertilizers and his available nutrients are much higher. So that just shows that by adding, by managing for complexity, integrating livestock, using cover crops, doing all of these things, keeping your soil covered, that that is making the inherent fertility in your, in your farm much higher. Um, this is an example of how that can happen. Um, this is a test that we did that, um, uh, shows the, well, actually this, this is showing how much is taken out by um, an average five ton per acre um, vineyard. So if you get five tons per, per acre in a vineyard, this is how many nutrients are being taken out. And this is showing um, the, the levels that we have in our vineyard uh, taken, I believe it was last year. And so, and keep in mind the nitrogen that there's, I think it's 38 tons of nitrogen over every acre of land 
and actually over every acre in the in the, in the uh, in the world. So nitrogen is not a problem, especially for people in regenerative agriculture, because it's readily available. You just need the microorganisms to take that. Um, you can see that our phosphorus levels, we have enough for, um, for uh, wait, I think, let me go to the next slide. This shows how long, how long our supply is. Um, that's uh, over a thousand years supply of phosphorus that we have. This is in the top um, two feet of soil, 70, 70 centimeters. Um, our potassium supply would last for 760 years, calcium 11,000 years. You can see we've got a, a, a completely adequate amount of most of these nutrients so that we don't, that we shouldn't need to add any. And that is our long-term objective is to make this a, a vineyard that requires no additional outside fertility. And a lot of these things uh, like, like um, nitrogen and carbon are available from the atmosphere. And these other things, we feel that we can provide them through uh, this kind of broad scale nutrient cycling that includes birds and insects, as well as livestock. Um, this is some of our soil test records that are showing that this is already occurring. Our soil organic matter has gone up 100%. This is before we've even received a harvest in the vineyard. Um, things like um, nitrate, which were a bit high, probably from previous farming practices, uh, have gone down. Our phosphorus has gone up. Um, our potassium, which was a little bit high, has gone down. And other things are moving in uh, various directions, but in general, we're going in an upward trend. And then some of the things that we uh, are trying that we don't necessarily want, like salts uh, and, and um, uh, what else? I think primarily salts and boron are going down. So that'd be sodium, chloride, and boron. And this is showing the things that are going up in green and the things that are going down in red. Um, I grew up, I actually saw this, this building on a napkin at a restaurant when I was a little kid and it was the first iteration of this building. My dad was an architect and so I realized at an early age the power of design. And so now I'm going to talk a little bit about what design can mean in, in grape farming. Um, first of all, the design needs to be guided by some type of principle and context. And we do that by using this idea of holistic management where you create a context, what are you trying to achieve? And I talked about that a, a bit early on, but basically again, we're trying to mimic the, a healthy ecosystem in this vineyard. And as much as possible then stay out of the way. So letting nature do the work and, and tapping into the intelligence of nature. And so um, I don't think that there's any one person or any group of people who are really smart enough to, to, to mimic nature. We need to just create conditions that allow, allow nature to do what it does best. So what that means is in a lot of ways, really just allowing nature to do what it does and not interfering with that. Uh, this is a list of the farming principles, uh, some of the farming principles that we use. And um, I'm, I'm not gonna float on this for too long, but if you guys want this, you can also, uh, I have some, some uh, references at the end of this and they can be, you can see these on our website. So now I'm going to quickly go through how we set up the vineyard at, at Piscinus Ranch. So this is the high trellis system that's de designed to be grazed at any time of the year and to allow for high diversity of, of plants, insects, and animals. This is what the site looked like before we did anything. Uh, the first thing we did was level out the, we had a lot of rodent mounds. We leveled that out, put a light application of compost on. And then the first year we grazed that. We did not plant any, any cover crop or anything. It was just a compost application. 
The second year we did a cover crop and that increased the carrying capacity of cattle by um, 10 times. So in that first slide, we had the equivalent of seven cows per day per acre on this. The second year with the same amount of rainfall and just the addition of cover crops, we had 70 cattle per acre per day on this. And they were on here for a very short time and then they moved off onto another site. And so this is the site of the vineyard before it was planted. Um, one of the things that I wanted to show you then, and I'm not sure if I can go back, um, I can't. So again, mimicking nature, you can see this is a, a, a scene of bison grazing in the Great Plains of America. And this is actually probably a very small group. I'm sure it's a very small group compared to what was there historically, because there's accounts of it taking, the, the bison taking days to pass by um, camps of the early explorers in this area. So there's, there's potentially millions of head of bison in some of these herds. And so what we're doing is just trying to mimic that with these animals by keep, keeping them in a tightly bunched group moving constantly. Uh, this was the last year before, so this was, um, this was towards the end of this year. And um, we're not kneeling in that photograph, even though you might suspect that, but you can see that how high the cover crop got in that. So we were able to really dramatically increase <clears throat> the fertility of that site. Um, we lambed in here and the sheep, when the, when the ewes would go off to graze, they had to tunnel through this in order to, 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 to get to the forage they wanted and their lambs would cry until their mothers came back. Um, this is actually pretty close to that same side of that last picture, but this is this year. This is taken in the middle of the day and you can see how, how dark and hazy it looks. And that is because of the smoke from fires. So this is the first year that we've been able to graze the vineyard during the growing season. And we just did a small trial in a section of the vineyard that was high enough, had, had enough vines that were high enough that we could do this. And, um, but going forward with this section, because the majority of the vines are high enough that we don't have to worry about them grazing the vines, um, we'll be grazing this section at any time of the year. And so what that means is that when, when we need to do some weed control or we need to, to add some fertility, we can bring the sheep in, we can graze them for as short a time as a matter of hours with a large group, or we can bring in a small group and divide the vineyard up and move them throughout the day or throughout the, the week to new sections and then allow adequate recovery for that. Um, this is actually showing the site where they grazed um, a couple of days after that. And you can see in the bottom part of the photo how, how the uh, soil is disturbed a bit. And then you can see in the middle part, kind of uh, parallel to where that um, ATV is, you can see that there's a bunch of weeds and plants growing there. And that was a section that we, that we purposely did not graze in part because we had a lot of smaller vines in there. And so you can see the difference that the sheep had both in, in the disturbance to the soil cover um, and in the amount that they ate. And they don't use any fossil fuel in the process of doing that. They, um, they don't create compaction. They don't create um, carbon emissions and they don't do unnecessary damage to the soil. So I wanted to quickly go over what some of the options are for grazing a vineyard. I realized that there's, that people have vineyards of all sizes throughout the world. And so a lot of, actually a lot of the vineyards that I've worked with have been smaller. And most of those either already had sheep or they had neighbors with sheep or they decided to bring in sheep uh, temporarily or to build a flock themselves. And so, um, in, in this country, we have the opportunity to rent sheep. There's a number of people, more and more every year, that are creating businesses where they will rent sheep to vineyard owners and orchard owners and, and farmers in general, so they can bring in uh, 
depending on who you're working with, they could bring in a very small group or they could bring in a large group that incur includes uh, herders that are watching those sheep. So depending on your size uh, would, would uh, dictate how many sheep you wanna bring in and, and how you're doing that. Um, you could also purchase the sheep at the start of the grazing season, graze them throughout that season and then sell them at the end or harvest them for, um, for yourself. Um, you could borrow sheep from a neighbor um, and you could raise your own flock. So th those are just a few of the obvious options. Um, in this country, we, we tend to pay to have people graze vineyards. In places like New Zealand, the, 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 the sheep producers actually pay to graze the vineyards because of that it's they, ju it's they just treat it like another form of pasture that they're that they're renting. Um, and we're actually getting towards the end here, and I wanted to talk about another way that we can integrate animals into cropping practices. I'd mentioned uh, grazing orchards, and it really is very similar to the to the vineyard setup that we're using in which you can graze these higher vines, which are basically almost like a, like a, a tree, like a tree crop, because all of, the, all of the fruit, all of the leaves are out of reach of the, of the livestock. So it makes it conducive to grazing. It, might, it, it actually is in some cases a little bit easier with an orchard because uh, they naturally grow a, a bit taller anyway. Um, but what I'm going to talk about here is something a bit different, which is, is how do we, how would we do this in a vegetable crop situation? This is a farm in Colorado where my wife and I farmed uh, before coming out here to this ranch. And this is the year before we did a, uh, a market vegetable farm in which we grew about 60 different kinds of, of vegetables. And so knowing that, knowing that this would be the site, we increased the intensity of the grazing here. And they're grazing a lot of probably, uh, it might be some type of millet and or sorghum Sudan. Um, and then there's some peas and, and a number of, 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 of uh, annual crops in there. You can see the, the wire and we were moving the animals about seven times a day on the new forage. So they're getting a lot of impact on a very small area for a very short time. We then, went through a winter. This is 7,600 feet in elevation. It gets very cold in the winter and the winter is long, the growing season is short. That allowed us to have a, a long period where the, there was a, a rest. And then we planted, as I mentioned, a, 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 high, a high diversity of uh, vegetable crops. This is all certified organic and um, we didn't have to uh, include any additional fertilizer to this site. Um, and we had a, an incredible yield of crops and um, numerous, uh, we sold most of these wholesale and one buyer, one buyer in particular came out to see what we were doing because they had never experienced the quality of, of um, crops that we were growing. And so they wanted to see how we were doing it. So I have some resources listed here that you guys can, can copy down. And I would like to now <clears throat> take questions. If I could jump on for a second. Uh, thank you very, thank you, Kelly. Um, and thank you everyone. The chat was very lively and I have um, been capturing all the questions from what's been going on, but I think it would be more stimulating actually if people felt that they wanted to unmute themselves and ask the questions directly. Um, if not, I can, I can start pulling them out. Um, maybe to kick us off, I know, uh, Rebecca, I saw that you had a lot of questions in here and um, quite a few around the cover crops and species of cover crops. So I'm not sure if you'd like to unmute yourself and um, ask whatever questions you felt were still unanswered. Yeah, it was just around the cover crops really about what, what you grow, Kelly, and how obviously we've got a slightly different growing season here. And if things grew more vigorously, what impact that would have on the vines themselves? Okay, that, that's a great question because 
Um, at this point, and I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that you are getting rains in the summer, and whereas we don't get rains in the summer, um, and because of that, we don't have a lot of competition. Oops. Keep going. We're just going to we, stop sharing. Okay. We don't have a lot of competition, and um, consequently, it's not really that the, our, our cover crop is only growing basically from the, the longest season that it would be growing from is the winter from, say, the end of October until um, maybe into late April, early May. And that would, again, depend on the rain, on the rainfall. Um, so we tend to use cool season annuals. And the, the longer that we are in, in this process of, of, of grazing the vineyard throughout the year, the less we will, we will be cover cropping because one of the things that we think we will be getting into is coming to a point where we might actually be in, uh, creating too much fertility in the vineyard. So um, as, as, as we move in, as the vines mature, we're gonna be backing off on the cover crops. But a, a, a general list that would include, that we have been using for the last few years would in, include some grains like in particular oats, um, barley, um, triticale, because we do grow our own triticale here. Um, and we have grown our own oats here for seed as well. Um, and then uh, a number of legumes, things like um, vetch, in particular, we're using a vetch variety called lana vetch, and uh, red clover, crimson clover, um, a forage radish, a daikon radish. Um, and then we'll do some flowers like California poppy, facilia, um, and sometimes we'll just throw some wildflower seed out there as well. And then in, in addition to that, we get all of the normal annual grasses that grow in this area and a lot of the, 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 the uh, forbs and wildflowers that normally grow here. So I haven't done an actual inventory of the species, but I will be doing that this, um, this spring. And hopefully we, we, I'll be able to do that because we have enough rainfall to get something growing here. But I, I've, I've been simplifying the cover crop mix um, over the last few years in anticipation of, of, of allowing more of what the site wants to express and trying to prevent too much fertility on the site. Kelly, can you speak a little bit to um, cover crops in competition with the vines? Okay, so um, the the competition with the vines would occur would, would occur obviously during the growing season of the vines, and again we don't have that issue so much because we we are we don't have rainfall during the summer. However, we are using irrigation, and so where the where the, where the drip what, where the water is hitting the ground from the from the drip, um, we do get vegetation that grows there, and in general. We've not had a lot of competition for that, even when we weren't able to put the, the, um, the sheep in there. Um, we have done some hand weeding, but um, in general, we have not noticed a lot of competition. And now that we are, are able to graze during the growing season, we will have even less. And one of the things I like about in, encouraging native species is um, a lot of our native species, probably because there's so much overgrazing early on when the when the Spanish first came here, and then by the the settlers after that, that a lot of the the native vegetation that remains is is pretty um, resistant to to um, grazing, either in that it's unpalatable or it's got uh, which is the main thing, or it has thorns and things like that that discourage uh, grazing. So um, I'm actually trying to increase the number of plants that are growing during the summer, um, and those but those won't be that um, interesting to the, most of those won't be that interesting to the, to the sheep. Um, so right now we have not had a, a big issue with, um, with competition from, from the uh, cover crop from the vine, with, with the vines. And I think oftentimes from a lot of my past experience, when, when the cover crop is growing well, the vine is growing well. And that 
the the thing that I would worry about is is if you didn't have irrigation, then you might, and you had very dry conditions, then you might want to have um, some way to control those vines if you don't if you're not using livestock. I'm gonna um, shoot you a couple of questions about sheep. If you can talk about um, if you've experimented with different breeds, and then in, particularly with. Um, can you talk about, uh, speak to about the saliva and what we might know about the saliva's effect? Okay, both good questions. I'm gonna start with the, the last one first. Um, if there's anybody in the group from France, there is a, um, a, 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 a writer from France who's no longer alive, but a, a, Fam definitely famous in the world of regenerative agriculture, especially with those of us at Grace. And his name is Andrew Voisin. And he wrote at least three books that I'm aware of. And he is the first one who talked about the effect of saliva that, that I saw, the effect of saliva on plants. And if you think about it from an evolutionary perspective, if a plant doesn't want to be grazed, it can develop all kinds of mechanisms in order to avoid that. There are physical things like thorns and, um, and stickers and, and different types of protection for the leaves. Uh, it can, they can grow up out of the, the realm of, of being reached by grazing animals. And then they can, they, they can, they can develop toxins or they can also have, um, just be unpalatable through, through um, the chemical makeup of, of the plant. So, so they could cause a plant to be sick or a, a grazing animal to be sick from grazing it, or it could be a, a, a toxin to it. So um, the, the, plants have, the plants that haven't done that probably are, 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 are not doing that because they receive some kind of benefit from grazing. And we definitely see there's a lot of plants that have, that have evolved with grazing animals. Um, probably most of them have actually, especially in more temperate regions where you had huge herds of, of, of animals. Um, so the, um, uh, the, in particular, saliva tends to stimulate regrowth. So a plant that is getting grazed by a animal. And I, I don't know if this is true with insects so much, but insects are, or can be herbivores too, but there may be some benefits from that as well. But we do know that with, with grazing animals, they, the saliva tends to stimulate the, the growth of plants. And we also see that somehow, and I'm not sure if it's been determined if this is from um, the saliva or a combination of the saliva and, and the dung and the urine, but that grazing can impart disease and pest resistance to plants. So for instance, um, in uh, one of the Andrew Vazan books that I read, he talked about, um, insect resistance from grasses, in particular from leafhoppers, from grasses that are grazed as compared to grasses that are mowed. So if you mow uh, your grass in your, in your vineyard or orchard, then you have the potential for damage to that and other plants from those leafhoppers. Whereas if that was grazed, that greatly reduces the incidence of damage from leafhoppers. And then to the to the sheep variety, sheep species, um, or sheep varieties, um, the main sheep that I've used are, are hair sheep. So those are sheep that have wool, but they shed it every, every, every summer. And so one of the advantages of that is we don't have to deal with, with, um, with uh, shearing of the sheep. And the other is that they have, um, uh, they tend to be particularly good for meat production. And so when that is one of our income streams is, is producing sheep for meat. And so we like to constantly, we like to focus on, on hair sheep breeds. And so right now we have probably about, let's say we have about 700 Katahdin sheep, which is a, a breed developed in this country from a cross of, of numerous hair and wool sheep. And then we are also raising, uh, we have about a thousand Dorper sheep here. We also have, we, we do have a few sheep that are, that are wool sheep. And um, in particular, um, I like the churro breed, which is a, 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 
a breed that the Navajo people, the indigenous Navajo people of uh, Arizona and New Mexico um, developed. And so um, we have a few of those and they've done, they've done particularly well in our situation too. And they, they do require um, um, shearing though. And what I would do no, regardless of where you are is try and find sheep that are adapted to your area. Do it that are adapted to the vegetation that grows in your area, and then look at the at, at the at, at what you are trying to achieve. I mean, maybe you're more interested in wool as an income stream, or maybe you're just interested in breed, a, a wool breed, and have neighbors that are interested in the wool. Um, so um, look at what's doing well in your area, and and on the vegetation that you're producing in your site. So the main thing I'm trying to do is if I am using plants or animals that are not native to this is I'm trying to have those that are as well adapted to the site as possible. Sure, I'm, I'm gonna pull for some more questions, but I wanted to see if anybody um, wanted to unmute themselves and ask Kelly their question directly. Looks like we have time for that. It'd be fun to hear some other voices. Give it a go. It's VJ here. Um, if you were laying out a, a brand new vineyard, how would you do it to best suit the system of cultivation, you know, row width, plant to plant, um, or a height? How would you do that? Okay, so I'm assuming that you're referring to doing this in England. I missed it. Um, where, where, where would you be doing this? Oh, in the United Kingdom. Okay. So there's a couple things. So um, I, in, if I was doing it there, I actually might be more inclined to use the electrified wire system that I showed and yeah. train the vines lower because one of the things you may be dealing with is getting, is getting enough heat to, grow, yes. to, to ripen your grapes. And if that's the case, then I would probably go with a lower training method, maybe some type of VSP system, and then um, use the electrified wires, which would allow you to graze that. Um, you, you make a good point, or bring up a good question in that um, the more space you have in your row, the more comfortable it, it is for your sheep. Um, so, and if you are, if you're, if you're training low and you can't access either side of the row with sheep, in other words, your, your vines are trained so low that you, that you, your sheep can't go under them, then, um, then you, then you want for the, for the comfort of the sheep, you want the rows to be wide enough where it, it, it they can actually move around in there a little bit without getting shocked. And um, you probably want, um, if you, I, I suspect you're gonna have to be doing sprays there. You want enough room so you can get your tractor down those rows and allow the additional space that is required to have the electrified offset. So in general, I would say you're probably going to be at least um, two to two and a half meters for, for, for your row spacing. Great, thank you. Thanks for answering that. Sure. Anyone else want to just jump in and ask directly? Yes, um, one question. Um, I was wondering, is there a problem with the sheep uh, eating the bark of the vine? Uh, very good question. And I have had that occasionally. And when that happens, it's usually an indicator of one or both of two things. And that would be not enough dry material in the forage mix. So this could occur uh, after periods, uh, after a lot of rain and with a lot of growth in your vegetation where you just have a lot of green matter and high protein and the animals are actually looking for some a carbon source. And if they can't find that, then in, in a vineyard, then this, the, the, the most obvious source would be to chew the, the bark off. And um, another possibility would be if they have some type of mineral deficiency. I'm not sure if, 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 if we got any of that question answered, um, but there were, there, so sheep eating bark is usually an indication of 
of either a mineral deficiency or a lack of carbon in their diet. And so this would occur most likely when you have a lot of green growing vegetation and not enough dry matter or if you have some type of, 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 of uh, mineral deficiency. So if you have a lot of green growing vegetation, make sure you might need to bring in some straw or something for them to eat, but also make sure that you have a, 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 a mineral mix that is, is geared towards what your specific deficiencies might be in the plants that are growing in your environment. And you can determine that through a, a blood or a liver sample of your, of your livestock and sending that into a lab to see what the mineral deficiencies are in the sheep itself. Um, because oftentimes you will, and it's good to check the livestock because you may have, if you test the plants, even though they may say there's plenty of something in there, the livestock may not be getting it. It may not be available. So I always like to check the source, which is the livestock and see what, um, what deficiencies they might have. Uh, just as a matter of interest, in my interest other people, is that we've just started grazing sheep here in the south of England, and we've used uh, Shropshire sheep because I've been told that they're very good, at, they keep their heads down and they're used in France in vineyards and in orchards and in uh, tree plantations. Okay, that's good to know. Um, I've, uh, it, I've, in my experience, um, just about any grazing animal if, if, it, if, it's, if it's overgrazed an area, we'll, we'll lift its head up to start looking at what's around. But I, I think that is an important thing because if you look at sheep varieties, and there are some books that, that actually delineate sheep by their forage preference and those that are basically all the way on the side of just wanting to eat with their heads down to those which on the far on the other side that want to eat with their heads up completely, which would be a goat. And on the... Um, on the hair sheep that we're using, they're somewhere in the middle and they actually look a little bit goat-like. But, um, and I, I prefer that because I do want them to do the suckering and they, and, and these, you know, because they're kind of in that mid range, they, they relish doing the suckering. So, um, and I, I actually don't have enough experience with other breeds to see if there's, if there's a problem with them not suckering but I suspect that that would not be a problem with, with the majority of sheep breeds. Kelly, can you talk a little bit about um, other perennial crops that would work in, in the vineyard? Okay, so um, I, I, I'd mentioned briefly that we are, we're pretty delighted to see some per perennial forbs um, like milk vetch and um, uh, another one is, um, oh, uh, birds, bird foot trefoil is, is starting to appear there too. Plus we're getting some of the native, native grasses that are starting to appear, um, the native perennial grasses. Um, but some other things that I'm looking at integrating by through planting are some of the native plants that grow in this area in areas that have a little bit more rainfall. And since we are creating the conditions of a little more rainfall with our um, with our drip irrigation, um, we can plant those here. One of those is a bush lupin. So that's another, um, it, it's, it's kind of similar in size to a grapevine. Um, it's a legume. It's, a great, it's great for beneficial insects and, and um, pollinators, pollinator bugs. And um, it is, it can be toxic to sheep. And I've, I've, I've grazed vineyards that have that plant growing in them and they will eat it completely down. But um, in small quantities, it seems to be very beneficial as well. So I'll, I'll plant a few of those. We have some um, other native bushes that are starting to grow in the vineyard on their own. Um, so I would look around at what's growing in your region and, and what you think might do well in your vineyard. Uh, one of the reasons to encourage those is because of getting a diversity of root architecture. And if you're growing something that grows native in your area, it's probably also um, very conducive to mycorrhizal fungi. And that might be a good way to get mycorrhizal fungi into your, into your, um, into your vineyard, but also increase kind of the root architecture and the root diversity and understanding that that's going to encourage uh, the diversity of, of microbes in your vineyard as below ground. And um, 
again, looking at that big overriding principle of increasing diversity. So um, I would, I would and, and another thing that you could consider are, are perhaps some, some uh, other berries or fruit trees that might do well in your area. Um, I have more questions we could feed you, um, but I'd like to invite if anyone else would like to unmute and ask their question direct. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I had a question. I'm actually not a wine grower, so I thought I'd sit back and let the actual wine growers ask their questions. So um, sorry if I'm jumping the queue. Um, I was curious, Kelly and Elaine, about your pest, or your pest and disease management. You were mentioning about the birds that you encourage onto the farm with the bird boxes, and that was great. Do you have any other tips about uh, managing pests and diseases naturally on with your vineyards and on your farm and even with the sheep? That you'd be um, able to share with us. Sorry, sure. I'm putting you on the spot here. No, that's a, that's a that's a great question, and I think again, one of the big principles is increasing diversity, and so uh, the more diversity we have, the better. And we've got a we've got a great natural example nearby. The closest national park to us is just about um, 20 miles down the road, and it has one quarter of all of the pollinator bee species, native pollinator bee species in this country can be found at that park. And it's not a very big park. And a lot of the same plants that are growing here. Um, and so it just makes me realize that we, we that again, looking at native plants to increase the diversity of beneficial insects, uh, creating habitat for those insects. I have seen things like uh, structures that encourage beneficial bees, um, but, um, uh, and, and one of the things also that we, we like to see, which is, which of course, you might expect this coming from an entomologist, but a friend of mine who's a, who's a PhD entomologist and does a lot of work in, in regenerative agriculture, says that he determines, one of the main ways he determines the health of an ecosystem is by how many spiders are there. Because spiders feed on insects, and so if you've got a good diversity and population of insects, then that will lead to a good, a, a good diversity of spiders. So um, I love going out into the vineyard in the morning when the sun is low and there's dew on everything and I can just see the whole thing covered with spiders. So that, that gives me um, a, a, a good sense that we have a, a, a nice population of insects. Um, so then the other thing is what, what, what else are you doing in your vineyard as far as sprays? So um, we, we are certified organic and um, but that doesn't mean that the sprays we are using aren't, uh, don't have negative effects on some of our beneficial insects. And so we're trying to research the least uh, damaging sprays options that we have to the insect population that we have. And so that's a kind of a constant, um, a constant struggle to, 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 to determine that. But um, for powdery mildew, which is our main, um, which is our main which is the only thing that we spray for actually, as far as disease and pests. Um, uh, we are, we're mainly using sulfur and, uh, and stylet horticulture oil. And we do know that the horticultural oil can have a negative effect. So we're trying to phase that out. And I think that spraying continuously with one thing like, like sulfur can have a negative effect too. Um, so looking at, at, at things like bacterial based, um, our, our, our predatory fungal based sprays is definitely something that we're, we're looking at and how we get away, get, get more towards botan botanical based um, uh, sprays, but also really monitoring whatever we spray to see what the effect is on our, our beneficial insect populations. Um, so those are some of the main things that we are doing in that regard. Um, hi, Kelly, could I ask something please? Sure. Yeah. This is Reagan. And I was wondering uh, when you've observed the sheep that have been trained uh, with the shock wires, um, do they, if they learn about the shocks when they're young, do they still reach for the fruit or the vines later as they're adults or do they not do that later on? Okay, that's a, that's a great question. And um, I, I, when I was testing that in the vineyard in the, in the trial that I did with the electric wires, I, I was mainly worried that maybe at some point there might be uh, 
damage to the charger and I would have to send it in or it would take a while before I could get a charge back on. So I shut off the electric fence um, while it was, it was, Af it, it was, um, let's see, it was, it was when there was very little for them to eat in the vineyard floor. So they were really, if there was any suck or anything like that, that they would, they would go for it. So I wanted them to actually be a little bit hungry so that they might try and go up there. And I left it off for a week. And after that point, I, I really needed to feed them. So, <laughs> but they, ne they never, they never w went and tried to graze above the electric wire. But that was a very, there was, there was just a, a small number of sheep in that, less than a dozen sheep in that trial. Let, actually, there was only about six sheep in that. And so the, the more sheep you have in there, I think the greater the chance that one of the sheep is going to figure out that the wire is not hot. So if I, if I had more sheep, I would, I, I would not test that. Um, and I don't think it would work to train them as a young sheep and think that that would still work later as an adult, um, especially if you're dealing with a large number of sheep. I think you want to keep that, uh, that wire electrified as much as possible. And I will set that up in larger vineyards. I'll set that up in zones so that you can shut off certain zones um, to do work in there. So you don't want to electrocute or shock yourself or, or your workers um, so that you can shut off portions. But if you did have to shut off your whole vineyard for a day or a couple of days, I don't think there'd be an issue with that. Um, especially if you can sh sh turn it back on when you leave out you know, if you're if you're just working for part of the day, you can turn it back on when you're when you leave. Oh, great, <laughs> thanks. Sure. It looks like we're going to need to wrap up shortly. So um, I would invite any last questions, any remaining unanswered questions, to go ahead and unmute and pop in. Um, yeah, could I ask a question? Yes. Uh, uh, mob grazing. How um, the the idea of mob grazing seems quite quite attractive to me. Did, are they? Um, can you move sheep quickly enough through a vineyard? Do you think to be able to uh, graze the cover crops, but not graze the vine? Um, I um, I'm going to say in general no, because and I, I think that would partly depend on the breed of sheep, and if they're not so so. Uh, I'm, I'm taking your scenario as being that you don't have any way to keep the sheep from grazing the vines. You're just trying to go through there quickly. Um, we do that in this country to do leaf removal because what happens is the sheep go through and they, they go for the vines first and they, they'll remove the leaf and you want to go through quickly because you don't want them to remove too much. So I would not say that it's, it's not possible, but I would say that you need to, you need to, I, I would test that on a small area first. Um, and it, it might be possible that you can run them through quickly, but in general, when you have sheep or cattle or any animal in a large group, there's a lot of competition for the forage. And so if you have them in a large group, they're gonna be looking in all directions for feed. So that's one of the, one of the things I'd be careful of is, is that. But it's possible if the forage was, was much more desirable on the ground than up above that you would not get too much damage. Okay. The, um, the the other thing I, I got sent an advert uh, through a, through the internet of a um of a sort of um sheep muzzle. But every time they look up, they um they they can't eat through the muzzle. But then when they go down, they can eat the uh, the uh, the cover crops. So have you ever heard of those sort of things? Oh yeah. Yep. I know people who have piles of, of those that are broken up behind their vineyard. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's a couple things. I, I, I have not used them and I'm, I'm actually not interested in those. I think it is an option for people, especially with smaller vineyards. I wouldn't want to mess with t t putting those on and taking them off every day. Um, and um, uh, also we are, we are going for uh, certified humane and I don't think that would pass that. Um, it doesn't pass my test for being humane. And also it, it, it doesn't allow me to sucker the vines. So it's taken away a lot of options, but it, it, for, 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 what, for, for my context, but for a smaller vineyard, it, it definitely is an option. And um, uh, I would try and check with people who have used those 
Um, it's a it's a it's a fairly clever idea, um, and um, again, I think for a smaller vineyard that that could be an opportunity. Um, so yeah. Well, yeah, it looks like an over-engineered um, idea, but, uh, but I'd like to try and find someone that's used them, but I uh, haven't yet. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Can I? Okay, I'm, I'm not hearing the question. Do you ever feed the sheep on the residue of the wine pressing? Okay, uh, if, in case anybody else couldn't hear that, do um, the question was, do we ever feed the sheep on the on the pumice, basically the residue from the the winemaking, and um, we we've used that for um, for making compost. I've not put it directly onto the vineyard to see if the sheep would eat that. I suspect they might eat a little bit, and you know, the grape seed is is very um, uh, nutritious, and it provides some oils and stuff. Um, I would want to make sure that there's other things to eat out there, but I, I think that would be worth looking into. May I ask a quick question? Go ahead. Uh, so I'm in the process of establishing a perennial cover crop in what was con a conventional vineyard. Um, and I wonder if you think it would be more important to get the perennial cover crop established before bringing in sheep or using the sheep to help establish that perennial cover crop? Uh, either way, I would, I would use the sheep to help establish that perennial cover crop. And um, um, the I would also, when establishing the, the perennial cover crop, look into using um, annuals as well as a nurse crop, depending on where you are. I'm not sure, sure where, you're, where you're coming from, but if you're in an environment that's a little bit more brittle or that is, is lower rainfall, then you might look at using um, a, uh, an annual as kind of a nurse crop for that, for that um, perennial cover crop. And then, then using sheep to graze that once it's, um, you, you don't wanna graze it when it's too small because that's, that's particularly hard on perennials. But um, once they're, they're big enough to, 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 to be able to go through a grazing and recover adequately, then I think having the sheep in there would be very beneficial um, in part because of the fertility of the, of the dung and especially the urine. Sheep urine is one of the most magical fertilizers I've ever come across, so. And especially for grape growers. That's awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Looks like we're in the last 60 seconds of <laughs> the workshop. And um, thank you so much, Kelly. I think one driving question was, where do we get your wine? And I wondered if in 30 seconds or less, you could talk about uh, some of the independent winemakers who are looking to Right, so we are not we're we're not making wine ourselves. We're trying to uh, work with independent, primarily natural winemakers. Most of them are women, and so nobody has made wine from the wine here yet. That will happen starting this year, and we will be posting who the winemakers are on our website. So if you guys um, if you guys check into that uh, this time next year, we should have an idea where the wine's coming from. Thank you all for participating. I really appreciate your questions and your interest.